Every day the sun rises and sets. We go about our lives as usual. Some places on earth, however, never experience this daily cycle, just the monotony of darkness. We can experience this world by venturing into the oceans at a depth of 300 feet or lower. An easier way to journey into a land without light can be done simply by walking through a forest. Caves are everywhere. Okay, my name is Pat Cambesis. I am the Assistant Director of the Hoffman Environmental Research Institute. The definition of a cave is um, an underground void that is humanly enterable. The geological purpose of caves is to act as um, drainage of the landscape. So basically, just like a surface river drains the landscape on the surface, um, caves are the underground drainage, and the reason why it's underground instead of surface is because limestone is very soluble and it basically sinks in the limestone and makes underground conduits. The karst landscape has everything to do with caves. Caves are one of the features of a karst landscape. So and a karst landscape is just a solutional landscape. It's one that was formed by the rock being dissolved by water. And so just as caves are a feature, so are springs and sinkholes and dry valleys and you know, all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Stalactites form when surface water gets into the, into the body of limestone and it starts to flow through the limestone and it starts to dissolve it. And what happens is, is it starts to take all of this calcium carbonate, or it starts to take the limestone into solution. And it gets to a point where it can't dissolve anymore. So now it's got more limestone, more calcite than it had when it started. And when it comes out in a cave, when it hits the air, then there's a little chemical reaction and it deposits a little bit of calcite. And so when you have water dripping in a cave or flowing out of a wall or whatever for hundreds and thousands of millions of years, whatever, then you start to get formations. You get the stalactites, stalagmites, all sorts of, of different varieties of those. They can be, there's stalagmites and stalactites that are huge. And usually you see those in tropical climates because there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the soil which makes the water initially you know, dissolve, but then it kind of, it, it, it brings a lot of calcite in the water and deposits it. How fast they form depends on how fast the water is dripping or flowing. So even though you might say, well, it's dripping at this rate, so we can figure out that it took X number of years, that's fine as long as the climate never changes or that the seasons never happen. So as long as you have a variation in the supply of water, you're going to have a variation in how long it takes for, for stalactites or stalagmites to form. You really shouldn't touch them because what happens is, is that you have oils on your skin and so if you touch them what happens is, is that you may um, affect how the water that's already depositing those, how it flows on there. So you really don't want to touch them. Soda straws look like little soda straws and they're the simplest kind of, I would call them a variety of stalactite and um, what they do is, is and sometimes I think stalactites start out as soda straws, but they're, they're deposited the exact same way that, say, a big stalagmite would be deposited, or stalactite would be deposited, by water dripping through little cracks in the ceiling and then depositing a little bit of calcium carbonate. And then if there is impurities in the water, then you can get stalactites and soda straws that are different colors. Some of them will be clear, some will be white. I've seen red ones. I mean, you can get all sorts of wild, wild and crazy colors. Flowstone, once again, is very similar to stalagmites and stalactites in that it's just water that's flowing into the cave, say, from cracks and crevices in the wall. Or it could be also, you could also get it, you know, from just a, a river flowing in a cave. And what it does is, depending on the season of the year or what's going on with the water, it will also deposit a little bit of um, calcite as it flows. 
you know, as it degasses, it'll deposit stuff. Rimstone dams, same same principle as is flowstone, only there's some kind of like irregularity or something in the in the in the ground. So what happens is when the water flows over it, you know, it kind of like I don't know, it causes it to deposit to deposit a little bit of, of calcite. There are vertical caves and there are horizontal caves. Okay, the horizontal caves are usually in areas that have pretty like flat lying limestones. Okay, and so the caves tend to form on bedding planes. Um, and that's, I'm partially incorrect on that. But if you go to, to an area, say, for instance, where you have big um, limestone, thick limestone units, and the water will flow in from the surface and it will sink and it will start to cut its way down. Instead of like going a straight line, it will start cutting its way down like vertically until it hits some kind of a bedding plane and an impermeable surface where it will flow horizontal for a while and then it will just keep, it'll stair step its way down. So it depends on the geology of the cave, whether it's horizontal or vertical. It also depends on, you know, like the structure of the cave. If you've got, you know, big gaping fissures, then of course you're going to have places where you have to, you need a rope to get down in them. And there's many places in the world where you need a lot of rope to get into the cave and move through the cave. Sometimes in caving, people are a little competitive, like who could find, you know, the coolest cave, who could find the next cave. And I was working with a group of guys, and they were being really secretive because they're working in this new area, this new little caving area. And so we would made a few little discoveries, and we figured we had this great potential cave to go going. But we didn't want to share it with anybody else, and we didn't want anyone else to know about it. So what we did was we had this stealth trip where we went and met everybody at the restaurant and told them that we were going to go somewhere else. So everybody thought we were in a completely different part of the county. So we go to where we're going to go, and we hide our cars, like we hide them in a barn, you know, so that nobody could see them. We go off into the woods, and we find the cave entrance, and we cover the cave entrance with a tarp and put the leaves on it so nobody can find us, and then we go in the cave. So unbeknownst to us, of course, one of our friends was suspicious, and he was, like, stalking us, which is a good thing, because we got into the cave, and there was one place where it required some rope to get down this big dome, this big pit. And it was only like 30 feet. But the way that, and then, and the guys that I was with didn't want to use the rope. They wanted to use a cable ladder. So we rigged it as a cable ladder. But the way they rigged it was such that when you put weight on it, you couldn't get your fingers around it. So, and, and it was all against a wall. So basically we were trapped at the bottom of a pit, didn't tell anybody where we were at. Nobody could see our cars. For all we knew, we were going to die down there. Luckily, the guy who was following us around turns up at the top of the pit, and we could hear somebody up there, and we start yelling, and he's like, oh, well, I was spying on you guys. And basically, he helped pull us all out. So if he hadn't been spying on us, I don't know what would have happened. We would have all froze to death down there because it was crazy. That was a stupid thing.